Well, good morning and welcome to my home. I can't think of a place that I would rather be doing this study than right here. As most of you know, we're starting a study today, five-week study called To Love Their Husbands. And it's so funny because Jamie O'Halloran and I were talking about this and when we were anticipating doing it in the sanctuary and saying how we didn't want to use the podium. The podium just didn't seem to fit with what I would want to do in the study. And uh, so we were talking about how could we arrange things? What might we do that would somehow make the atmosphere warmer? You know, uh, more, in fact, we actually use the phrase home-like. <laughs> and I can't help but wonder if the Lord was just smiling as we were saying that, thinking, knowing, yes, it would be home-like. In fact, it would be in my home. So I just love that. And the whole thing, oh, I do want to say that I know I had announced that Jamie O'Halloran was going to be starting the study today, sharing the testimony of her 40-year marriage. But those plans were changed. She's still going to share with us, so don't give up on that. But we decided to start with me uh, initially instead. So I love the thought that you're here, that the setting is my home. And personally, as I've thought about it, I told myself I was just going to picture all of you sitting around my living room. And I'm hoping it's going to feel that way to you, too. You know, just that you're sitting, listening to an older woman, well, old woman, just getting to share with you on a subject that's so dear to my heart. And so I'm praying that God is going to bless this time, that he's going to use this time, that while we can thank technology for making it even possible, at the same time, it's going to feel personal because the Lord would love that and I'm trusting that he will do it. You know, the world has a very loud voice. Whether it's TV, whether it's social media, whether it's our neighbors, our friends. But we get a constant message from the world. And sadly, it is not usually in agreement with what the word says. And so this study will be probably very contrary to what you would hear in the world. But I want you to know that it's going to be based on the scriptures. It's the Bible that's going to be our handbook. And I'm trusting that his word is going to resonate as truth as we share it. Let's pray. Father, we do come to you this morning and we give you thanks because we know you're here. And Lord, I love the thought that he, right now your eye is upon each woman who's gathered to hear this study. You know her life, you know whether she's married, whether she's still single. She may be a widow. She may be a bride. And Lord, it is my prayer that you're going to take this time and use it, Lord, for your purposes to instruct, to encourage, to give direction, 
and to bless. Lord, that is always your heart, to bless your children. And so you have your way in this time, I pray. And Lord, where correction perhaps enters in, help us to be teachable. Where we feel that resistance in ourselves, Lord, help us to trust you, to trust your word, which is truth. So have your way. We're committing this time to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you well know, today there's very little worth that's given to being a homemaker, you know, creating a home. And we're going to talk about that as we get into this study, but the major part of the study is going to be focusing on loving your husbands. When the Lord first uh, was drawing me into the women's ministry, there was a verse in Titus 2 that absolutely grabbed my heart in such a way that uh, I could not resist. It was a word that I just found so impacting and actually it accomplished getting, having me in the women's ministry when there was nothing else about that that appealed to me at all. And yet here, 34 years later, I, I still love that verse. And I consider it such a kindness of the Lord that he would allow me to yet again share with you women and uh, hopefully encourage you, instruct you, bless you. So if you'd like to turn to Titus 2, I'm going to read from there. And I'm actually going to start in the third verse. And this is the NIV. You can read it in any translation, and it's wonderful. But this is my own Bible. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. I have had such a heart response to this verse, and I am praying that you will too. I know when I read it, as I said, that was 34 years ago. The thing that blessed me and touched my heart was that it was so simple, so direct. A word from God's word of what he wanted older women to be teaching younger women. And I think the reason, I mean, at that time it seemed like a, a very um, Im impacting scripture and yet now it's all the more. And I think I was sensing then of what in fact was evolving and to what it would be today. So we're going to be looking at God's design for marriage. It might be very, very different from what the world would say. But I'm so glad that God wants our marriages to thrive. And he has given us instruction in his word that will help those marriages to thrive. You know, it's so contrary to what the world offers. The world 
tells us that we are to be so um, preoccupied with ourselves. In fact, we could call this the me generation. You know, what, what's going to be good for me? What's going to make me happy? What's going to be fulfilling for me? And actually, we can even look at marriage in that way, can't we? You know, is it going to meet my needs? Is it going to make me happy? And we're going to instead be thinking in terms of our Lord, who came to this world not to be served, but to serve. And we're going to try to pattern our lives after his, which will require a laying down of our lives to be all that he wants us to be. And, and I just trust that he will have his way in each one of us. I so want to commend you for wanting to be a godly wife. And you may be a wife now, or as I said earlier, maybe you're still single. But I can guarantee you that knowing what God's word says about marriage will always be beneficial. Because even if you're not married, you may well find yourself in a place where you're coming along some, someone who is. And maybe she's in a trying time in her marriage. Maybe she's really going through it. And I'm hoping that by going through God's words, seeing what he says about marriage, that if you're in that place to offer another woman counsel, the counsel will be godly counsel. It's going to be using his word. It's going to be um, with his word as the foundation of your counsel, not what the world would be telling you. And so I'm blessed that you're here. I think of the attitude most of you, I'm sure, had, those of you who are married, when you first got married. Wasn't it your desire to bless your husband, you know, to make him happy? I, I think of the many brides I have seen over the years. And I've watched them as they stood up at the altar and they were repeating their vows, gazing into the eyes of their soon-to-be husband. And I'm sure that each one of them in that moment had only his happiness in mind, had only the thought of how they were going to bless him. And yet, sadly, what happens? You know, too often, as time goes by, we slip into some patterns that are not so great. We become critical. We act like our husband's Holy Spirit, maybe even worse, his mother. And that is not part of God's role for you as a wife. And so we're going to be looking at several different stories from the Bible that are, I'm hoping going to illuminate the things that we look into. But I do think that often it starts with the role models we've had in our lives. You know, some of you have had great role models. You've grown up in a Christian home. You had a Christian mother who loved the word and, and walked in her marriage uh, reflecting the Lord. That's great. But I want you to know, to be a godly wife, you don't have to have that background. In fact, 
Corrine, and this is a woman you're going to hear about through this study. I will probably use a couple of illustrations from her life. But Corrine is a friend of mine who is probably the most godly wife I have ever known. And she did not grow up with a godly mother. In fact, she would say that her mother wore the pants in her family. And her dad was a kind, gentle, godly man. And she said that there were so many times that she observed her mother just kind of railing on her dad, nagging him, um, criticizing him. And she said for the most part, her dad would respond to that just being quiet. And she said, but invariably, if that lasted long enough, he would walk to the door, he would put on his jacket, and he'd go for a walk, a long walk. And she saw that pattern repeated many, many times. And she knew, even as a child, that that was wrong. And she said she remembers just promising herself that that is not the kind of wife she would be. And she certainly succeeded with the Lord's help because, as I say, she was a wonderful, godly woman. So while the world screams at us and its philosophy tries to get into our lives, we're going to come back to the scriptures and we're going to let them speak to us. In Psalm 119, 66, it says, Teach me knowledge and good judgment, for I believe in your commands. And then in Psalm 32, 8, one of my favorites. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with mine eye. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. You know, some of you are teachable, and some of you not so much. And I'm praying that the Lord will make each one of you teachable. You know, when a gal comes to my office and is sharing her life with me, sometimes the counsel I give can just be what I would say, you know, comforting, affirming. And that's always great. But there are times when that counsel might be speaking words of correction. And it's always interesting because some women, as I'm sharing, it's almost like I can see them sitting there with their hands on their hips listening to me. And I can tell by that expression that um, it's very likely they're not going to act on the things that I'm sharing. And the ones who are teachable sit there. And I can tell by their response that they want to apply that correction to their lives. They want to be obedient to it. And that is always such a blessing to me, to see those women who are teachable. And it's funny because there have been times when as a woman has left, I've had this thought, well, I don't think she'll be coming back. And yet sometimes a few weeks later, she'll reach out to me. And then that tells me that the Lord has had his way with her, that by his Holy Spirit, he has been speaking to her and she's been receiving 
that correction. You know, you know the type of woman you are. Are you one who tends to want to go your own way? You might say, oh, I'm just kind of stubborn, always have been. Or are you one who says, Lord, I want your will in my life. And it's my prayer that that is who you are. And if during this study there are things that I share that you know are bringing conviction, and you know that there is that part in you that would resist, I would encourage you right now to say, Lord, make me teachable. I don't want to be stubborn like that horse or the mule that can only be controlled with bit and bridle. Lord, I want to be yielded to you, yielded, obedient to your word. We're going to have a couple of scriptures that will basically be what I call foundational scriptures for this study. And I'd like to look at them now. So you might want to turn to 1 Corinthians 13. And I know you're all probably right now thinking, oh, I know that passage. And you do know it, I'm sure. It's one that is a beautiful description of God's love for us. And I'm going to read that to you now. And it starts in verse eight, 4, and it will end in verse 8. And again, this, this is the NIV. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Verse 6, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And as I say, this is really a description of God's love for us. But I want to give you an assignment to carry out between this week and next. And that is, I'm asking you to read those four verses every morning. I want it to be a part of your devotional time. And, and the change I would have you to make is every place where it says love, I want you to insert your own name. So for example, I would read the saying, Judy is patient. Judy is kind. And perhaps right there, I might have conviction because I'm thinking, Judy isn't always patient. Judy isn't always kind. And when that conviction comes, I want you to stop right then and say, Lord, please help me to be patient. You might even ask him to, to bring to your mind situations where you typically are impatient. And I will tell you, if you pray that way, you ask the Lord to help you, uh, he will bring to your mind very definite situations that you're going to know are true. And then you might say to him, so Lord, I don't want to do that anymore. Help me to be patient. That's probably going to happen again today. Please help me to be patient. Or with any one 
of those descriptions where you know that that doesn't describe you, ask the Lord to help you. Stop and pray right then, asking him to help you. And the thing that I want to encourage you in is you might think, I, I can't do that. I'm not perfect. And you're right. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. None of us is perfect. But guess what? Who indwells us? As believers, the Holy Spirit indwells us. And his love, this description of love, his love should be evident in our lives. And so that is your assignment for this week, that you would read that every single morning, prayerfully, asking the Lord to bring that conviction but also encouragement that he is going to do that work in you. And you're going to be blessed by it as well. Well, the second scripture that we're going to be looking at, as I say, this is what I would consider a foundational scripture. I'm actually going to read to you from the Amplified Version because it is so good. And so perhaps for this one, rather than looking it up in your own Bible, unless you have the Amplified, you can just write down its address. It's Ephesians 5, 22. Well, I'm not going to read it all, actually. It's 22 through 33. But I'm not going to read the part that's for your husbands. So in verse 22, it says, Wives, be subject. Be submissive and adapt yourselves to your own husbands as a service to the Lord. Now, it occurs to me that perhaps some of you don't are, are aren't familiar with the Amplified Version. And what it does is it uh, illuminates, I would say, a passage by putting in parentheses other words to help open up the meaning for what you've just read. And so for the word subject, it is in parentheses, be submissive and adapt yourselves. And so that will be as I continue reading. Then I'm going to jump down to verse 33. And it says, and let the wife see that she respects and reverences her husband. Now here's the parentheses. Parenthetical. <laughs> that she notices him, regards him, honors him, prefers him, venerates and esteems him, and that she defers to him, praises him, and loves and admires him exceedingly. And you might think to yourself, oh my goodness, how am I ever going to do all of that? But this is where I want to encourage you. This is what the Lord desires for you as a wife. And you may say, well, if you knew my husband, you would understand why I cannot always treat him with that kind of respect. And that's where I take you back to verse 22, where it says to be subject to your own husbands as unto the Lord. And what I want to encourage you to do is if that is your situation, that you do struggle with showing your husband the respect that you know the Lord would have you to show him, can you look past your husband, so to speak? Can you see that 
as you show him that respect, it's really as unto the Lord. If you can do that, it will be a tremendous help for you because the Lord is always worthy of that respect. And so those are the two passages that are foundational to this study and we'll be referring to them often. You know, the Lord, it was years ago, many years ago now, it was when I first really came into the women's ministry and I was doing a lot of counseling. And if this was a passage that I would often share with the women, was from Ephesians 5. And I remember when the Lord it just illuminated it for me. And what he showed me was just um, so helpful in being able to understand the way men and the way women are. You know what, what does it tell the husband? Husbands, love your wives. Why? Because women need to feel loved. They need to feel cherished. And I thought at that time about the women who would come to my office, and, and they might be telling me pretty tough situations, you know, where their bills weren't being paid, where they might live in a very crowded home situation and have several kids. Maybe the husband was unemployed. And yet with all of those things that they were dealing with, all of those trials, if that woman felt loved, it was amazing because she really could do well in spite of all of the trials. Whereas, I also observed that a woman could come to see me and she could drive up to the church in a BMW. She could be wearing beautiful clothes. She could be having everything that the world would say should make her happy. And yet, if she was a woman who did not feel loved, it was amazing, really sad, how sad she was. Also in the counseling, I realized the Lord started giving me ears to recognize as women would be telling me about their marriage. Tell, telling me about some specific situations that had perhaps gotten them into a big fight or whatever. And again, it was the Lord that helped me to start to see that all too often what had escalated that argument, what had perhaps even started it, was that she had not been showing her husband respect. And so the Lord showed me at that time that this is the key, and it's all right there in Ephesians 5. Women need to feel loved. So the Lord says, husbands, love your wives. But in the same way, Husbands need to be respected. See, our world, well, it's all gotten even worse now, but this, you know, was 30 years ago. Our world was saying that, oh, men and their frail egos, you know, they always have to have their eagles, egos stroked, you know, that they... They're just so demanding, you know. No. Even as God made 
women to need to feel loved. God made men to need to be respected. It's, it's part of their DNA. It's not their frailty. It's not their weakness. It is the way God made them. And the thing is, even as I'm sure you know, that you do respond when you feel loved. Your husband will respond when he feels respected. And it wasn't, maybe it was 10 years later that I happened to turn on James Dobson on the radio and the program had already started so I had missed the very beginning. I didn't know who he was interviewing. But everything that this man said I loved and I was laughing because he presents his information with a great sense of humor and um, and everything he was saying I was agreeing with I think I was probably answering the radio you know speaking out loud just saying yes because everything was what the Lord had shown me about 10 years before and so at the end of the program, I was very eager to hear who this man was. And of course, it was Emerson Egerich. And James Dobson went on to say that he had written this book called Love and Respect. And he was traveling all over the country, uh, you know, teaching these principles. And I thought to myself, I could have been a wealthy woman if I had written a book at that time <laughs> on the very truths that women just need to feel loved and men need to feel respected. It might sound simplistic, but all I can tell you is over the years I have seen its truth again and again and again. And I think because of the way our culture is, you know, you can show disrespect to a husband without even knowing at the moment that that's what you're doing. You can do it by um, keeping him waiting at church. That's a good one. <laughs> now, I'm not saying you're never supposed to, you know, visit at church. And many of your husbands say, it's okay. But you know when a husband has been waiting too long. And that you should respond to. What about talking on the phone when he's home in the evenings? That doesn't show him much respect. What about correcting him, let alone interrupting him? How often do you see these behaviors? How often is it something that you do? Do you put your husband down? There's no way that putting your husband down is showing him respect. And that's whether it's just you and him or whether it's in front of other people. Do you ever uncover your husband to friends? That is surely disrespectful. See, we see that behavior all the time on TV, don't we? I mean, think of any commercial. Isn't the husband always the, the dumb one and the wife the one who knows how to do it and that that's what's shown? That's what the world says. The world doesn't tell us to show respect to our husbands. But God's word makes it clear that it's important. And I will tell you, it will make a difference in your relationship with your husband. You know, think about how you looked at your husband when you were dating him. I often love to tell the story. Of, this is when we were, when I first came up to Portland and the church office was in Tualatin. And... Uh, Seth Sumetz had an office right opposite mine, only his office was 
had glass panels so you could see into it. And I remember one day I was walking past his office and as I came out of my office, I looked and I saw Seth sitting at his desk with his back to me. And there were several people in his office and one of them was Shannon C, who at that time was the church bookkeeper. And she was kind of down on her knees looking up at Seth. And she had this smile that was communicating to me, much more than just a smile. And as I walked past, this was only observing her for you know three seconds, my thought was, Shannon, what are you doing looking at Seth that way? And then I turned the corner, looked in the office again, and to my great relief, it was not Seth, but John, the man she is now married to. What did I see in her eyes? I know you all know, because if you're married, you have looked at your husband that way too. It's this look of adoration. You know, again, you see that look on the bride when she is repeating her vows to her, her husband-to-be. How do you look at your husband? You might ask yourself, you might ask the Lord to help you to see how you look at your husband. And when you're having a little disagreement, ask the Lord to give you a nudge. What's the look in your eyes? You know, the Lord wants you to be your husband's cheerleader. Your husband wants to be your hero. I absolutely believe that. And so when you show respect to him, it's huge. And I'm encouraging you to be mindful of that this week. To ask the Lord to help you to see, to recognize when you're being respectful and when you're not. And what's your motivation to being a godly wife? Is it uh, all about you so that you'll be happier? Your marriage will be um, fulfilling your needs? Well, yes and no. <laughs> because I do believe your motivation should be to bless the Lord, to honor His Word. And that as you do that, you are going to find yourself happier. You are going to find yourself more fulfilled. I believe it's going to be reflected in your marriage. But ask the Lord to help you, no matter what the starting point is for you today. Some of you might be thinking, okay, this is doable while others of you might be thinking, oh, Judy, if you only knew the patterns in my home. My habits are like deep trenches. Can I tell you, can I encourage you, the Lord is going to help get you out of those trenches. He's going to deliver you from those patterns as you purpose to be obedient to his word. Ask the Lord to help you to trust him to be the one to do it. In Philippians 1, 6, again, I know this is a verse you all know, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And then in the same book, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Yeah, you may see things in your life that you know need to change. 
behavior that you know must stop. But don't feel overwhelmed. No, count on the fact that the Lord is going to help you. The Lord is going to be the one to do this beautiful work in your life. And he's promised to do it and to complete it. So God bless you. I'm looking forward to our getting together next week. And I'll be praying for you daily. Bye-bye.